morning. Good morning. It's such an honor to be here to Chief Justice Rabner, to the Honorable Judge Grant. I want to recognize Jessica Lewis Kelly for her masterful work and working with the team to put together this important and timely conversation and to express my deep gratitude for the chance to be a part of it. As was mentioned, my name is Ryan Haygood. I have the real distinct honor of working with an amazing team of some of the fiercest lawyers, PhDs, community organizers, activists, and advocates at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. I'm joined by one of them, Hino Patel, who will testify this afternoon. And I wanna give a special shout out to my colleagues, Andrea McChristian, Yannick Wood, Hino Patel, and Brooke Lewis for helping me craft this testimony today. Uh, when I was leaving to come here, my wife asked me what I would talk about. And I said, I, I think I just wanna say a word about who we are and who we can be. And she said, oh, that, that makes sense. You're just gonna, you're gonna tell the truth. I said, I guess in a manner of speaking, I'm gonna tell the truth. My wife is an educator of 25 years. She's been the principal of Avon Avenue School in Newark for the past 12 years. And she said, that's what I do. I look at my students, I say sort of who they are today, and I cast a vision for who they can be over time. So I wanna channel both my wife, but I also wanna channel Professor Eddie Glaude, who, as you all know, on the first day has been invoked a number of times appropriately here. On the first day of our conference, he challenged us with his description of an America and a New Jersey that he said is deeply divided by racism. And he said, we have this difficult reality that we have to, quote, confront that we built this country and this New Jersey true. He then went on to urge us that here in New Jersey, we have to pause on patting ourselves on the back, as we descri he described as a, a liberal bastion, because he said, the numbers, the racial inequalities here in the Garden State are too stark for that. And so what I would like to do is part of discussing sort of who we are as a state and who we can be in this moment is to situate my remarks in the numbers, to situate my remarks in those racial inequalities. At the Institute, we spend a lot of time looking at New Jersey's racial disparities, which we say reflect real deep racial inequality. We think about where they came from historically and how we continue to live in the shadow of those racial disparities and racial inequalities. And so as you all know, as we gather this morning, we are more than 18 months into a COVID-19 pandemic that has devastated parts of New Jersey with the third highest death rate in America and which has disproportionately impacted communities of color. COVID-19 was the leading cause of death among black people in the state last year. And it really is this public health crisis that we think has exposed the pre-existing the deep-seated structural cracks of racism in our foundation that we all stand on. We did not create that foundation to be sure. We inherited it, for, but for us as lawyers, as people of conscience, I think this moment summons us to think about how we together fill in those cracks to build a new foundation. Because those cracks, as we have seen, have caused real earthquakes in black communities and other communities of color. And those cracks have manifested themselves in some of the worst racial disparities in the country right here in New Jersey. I wanna say about a bit about what those cracks look like specifically. It is in our state, one of the wealthiest states in the country, second this year only to Maryland, that the individual net wealth for white adults is $106,000. It's among the highest individual net wealth of anyone in the country compared to just 179 United States dollars for black people. $106,000 individual net wealth for white New Jerseyans versus 179 United States dollars, which is less, as you all know, than the cost of the iPhones that many of us are resisting looking at chief judge and less than the cost of groceries for a small family. And these cracks also cause black infants in New Jersey to experience the highest racial disparity rate in mortality in America. They cause black kids, like the ones my wife has been teaching for the last 25 years, to attend the sixth most segregated school system in the country. In 25 years of teaching, my wife, thousands of kids, three different schools in Newark, New Jersey, has never had a white student 
as an example of the way in which we live in real grinding racial and residential and school segregation in the Garden State. These cracks, to be sure, they're part of our DNA dating back to when we were founded as a colony. It was in New Jersey during our founding as a colony that we provided 150 acres of land to each English white settling family. And we incentivized slavery in the state by giving those same families an additional 150 acres of land for each enslaved black person that was brought to this colony. That is why New Jersey was referred to as the slave state of the North. We must confront this painful reality with sober minds because we live today in the shadow of that beginning and the generations of structural racism that followed leading us all to stand on a foundation that is cracked by structural racism. So how Ryan does all of this relate to why we're here today? because New Jersey's criminal justice system was shaped by that structural racism as well. And we know that because black kids in New Jersey are incarcerated at a rate 18 times that of white kids, though black and white kids commit most offenses at about the same rate. And incarcerated kids too often end up as part of the adult system. We know that because black adults are 12 times more likely to be in prison than white adults also the highest racial disparity in the country. I am struck by the fact that in this particular moment, the 2020 census showed us that New Jersey has grown to more than 9 million people. In our state, the Garden State of more than 9 million people, in an admittedly small youth prison population, there are eight, eight white kids in prison and the rest are black and brown. I am not advocating for the deeper incarceration of white kids, but that stark number shows us that we have been able to muster the kind of compassion that should attach to some kids, but not to others. And then what do we do with the racism in our criminal justice system? Well, we import it into our democracy, into our courtrooms, so that now incarcerated people cannot vote, though we were able to champion the right to vote for people on probation and parole. And we deny people with criminal convictions a chance to serve on juries for life. We must confront the fact that our system of jury selection through the use of peremptory challenges also perpetuates structural racism built into our criminal justice system. As you all know, it was 35 years ago when Justice Thurgood Marshall warned us about the use of peremptory challenges. And when he said, quote, peremptories will not end the racial discrimination that are injected, sorry, um, that we will, that the decision, the Batson decision will not end, quote, racial discrimination that peremptories inject into the jury selection process. Justice Marshall was right. Indeed, as we're having this conversation here in New Jersey, a trial, as you all know, is underway that has great import both to this conference and to our nation. And as you know, it began with an incident that occurred in a small Southern town in Georgia where Ahmaud Arbery was jogging down a residential street when he was followed by a group of white men in pickup trucks, one of whom was carrying a shotgun. They chased him, you all the facts. They confronted him. They believed that he did not belong there and they shot him to death. And this tragedy didn't end with his death. It didn't end with the tragedy of his death for himself or his family, his community, because the town where he was killed was 55% black. But during jury selection for a trial that's in progress as we speak, 11 of 12 black potential jurors were struck from the panel through peremptory challenges that were made by defense attorneys leaving a sole black juror. 11 white jurors in a trial involving three white men accused of killing a black man nearly guarantee that justice will not be received following his killing, with the judge even conceding that intentional racial, intentional racial discrimination likely infected that jury selection process. And as we know, it's not limited to Georgia. We see examples of this in Curtis Flowers cases and cases across the country 
And though it's true that there's limited data about how, how, how particular peremptory challenges impact juries here, we have a sense enough to know that peremptory challenges are part of a broader criminal justice system that was shaped by structural racism, leading to the underrepresentation of black jurors across the state. So what do you do then to channel Professor Eddie Glaude with a system that looks like this? Do you make reforms around the edges? Do you take stock of who we actually are and think about who we can be? And I submit that we can't look to slight reforms to reform our existing foundation, which itself is correct. Because as Professor Eddie Glaude reminded us, this is a critical moment for us in New Jersey to tell the truth about who we are and to build a new system, a new foundation for our criminal justice system. Those of us in the room today have, I think, a unique opportunity of a lifetime to begin to repair that harm. And to accomplish this, I just wanna offer a few quick parting ideas, Chief Justice, about how we might take the following transformative, though not exhaustive steps. First, we have to stop playing with peremptory challenges and abolish them outright here in New Jersey. Second, we have to expand four cause challenges. Third, we have to extend the right of jury service to people with criminal convictions. Fourth, New Jersey's courts must have the flexibility to draw jurors from particular areas within a county or from multiple counties. And finally, Given our staggering racial wealth gap, we have to pay jurors at least a minimum wage if we really want to create a cross section of the communities that have been too long excluded from the jury selection process. This is, I think, a moment to do some real repair, to fill in the cracks of our foundation and to build a new system that we don't now have. And I don't want to miss it. And together, I don't think we will. Thank you. <laughs>